Now, Hal Putoff uh, has called um, this new technology metric engineering because in Einstein's theory of gravity, uh, called general relativity, space-time is also called the metric field. So Albert Einstein showed that space and time fuse together into a field similar to the electromagnetic field. It's also called by John Wheeler the geometrodynamic field. He explained gravity in 1915 as the warping or curving of this unified space-time field by something called stress-mass-energy density tensor. We need the calculus of tensors to formulate Einstein's equations precisely. Now here's the point. Normally it does require enormous mass energy to significantly warp or curve space-time. For example, the universal gravity acceleration, which is 10 meters per second per second, of all objects independent of their mass in a vacuum chamber at the surface of Earth is caused by the total mass of the Earth, which is six times 10 to the 21st power in tons. That's a one with 21 zeros after it. That's a million, million, billion tons of matter to create the gravity we feel uh, at the surface of the Earth. We say under normal conditions that space-time is very stiff it takes a lot of energy to warp a curve it significantly, but not so in the case of the Tic Tac. This is the key. There's a trick here using what are called pumped layered metamaterials at around the nanometer, that is billionth of a, centi a billionth of a meter scale. A loophole that allows us to soften the space-time fabric in a thin boundary layer around the fuselage of the Tic Tac. Okay, hold on just a second. Can, can you explain just briefly what a metamaterial is for the audience? Well, yeah, a metamaterial is um, an artificial material that's constructed uh, as a lattice of certain kinds of regularly shaped objects. It was, um, and it has very uh, interesting properties. It, it was first done, I think, in the field of microwave engineering. But what um, Eric Davis and others at the To The Stars Academy are reporting in retrieved materials from these uh, a crash tic-tac -tac or flying saucer type objects uh, with electron microscopes, they're able to see uh, the kind of metamaterial meta lattice structure uh, at the billionth of a meter level and maybe even at the angstrom level, which is one-tenth of a nanometer or so. Um, and... Um, so uh, the point is, the point is that these metamaterials have strange electromagnetic properties. They have what are called negative indices of refraction. And technically what this means is that you can take an electromagnetic field and when it goes into the metamaterial, it can develop a negative energy density in effect and that would cause anti-gravity. But the problem is that even if this negative energy density is formed inside the metamaterial, the effect was still too weak to be seen uh, uh, um, you know, for metric for flight purposes. And, and so it's a microscopic effect. It's a microscopic effect. In fact, it's, it's really un uh, undetectable. It's so tiny, it's undetect undetectable. But there's another trick. There's another trick. And uh, that's this uh, idea that you have to reduce the speed of light inside the metamaterial to a very small number. And this can actually be accomplished. It's, it's a well-known phenomenon in uh, what they call Bose-Einstein condensates, or uh, in, in uh, general terms, superconductors or superfluids, where the, in, the effective index of refraction for certain frequencies and wavelengths uh, becomes very large. So that means the speed of light gets very small and from Einstein's equations, we know that if you can reduce the speed of light to a very small number inside the material, then the effective stiffness of the surrounding space-time gets less and less, which means we can actually warp space-time uh, by a very large amount with a very small amount of energy. Maybe even a AAA battery can do it. Really? Yeah, see, that's the trick. That's the trick, and that's what we're actually seeing in these encounters of uh, uh, these unidentified flying objects 
uh, with the uh, USS Nimitz Battle Group back in 2004, and apparently there was another sighting uh, event like that with the USS Roosevelt Battle Group in 2015, and I'm sure there are many others that they're not talking about. But those two, those two sightings and encounter, close encounters uh, have been made public by the Pentagon. Well, can you get into more detail on this process or, or effect that, that will allow us to... Um, manipulate gravity using extremely small amounts of energy. ...are at the forefront of research in solid-state physics. They exhibit many intriguing phenomena, such as superfluidity and condensation. Polaritons offer unique possibilities to study quantum physics. In this video, we will discuss what polaritons are, and how they acquire their remarkable properties. Think about a guitar. This is a simple mechanical resonator. When the string is hit, it starts to oscillate and produces sound waves with a characteristic frequency, or pitch. These resonant frequencies, as they are called, are the ones for which exactly a whole number of oscillations fit between the clamped points. For waves with other frequencies, the string tries to move at the points where it is clamped down, and the waves quickly become very weak. Only waves at the resonant frequencies can survive on the string. Just like the sound waves on the guitar string, light can also be thought of as a wave. Each color of light has a different frequency, and every frequency corresponds to a different wavelength which is the distance between the neighboring peaks of the wave. Visible light has wavelengths ranging from 450 to 700 nanometers, a size smaller than one thousandth of a millimeter. Now imagine two parallel mirrors facing each other. This is an optical resonator. It confines light inside by making it bounce between the mirrors. The light waves are trapped in a similar way to the sound waves of the guitar string being trapped between the two clamps. As a result, only some frequencies will be resonant and able to survive between the two mirrors. The smallest possible resonator is the one where only half of the wave fits between the mirrors. The wavelength of light is less than a micrometer, so an optical resonator that confines less than several wavelengths of visible light is therefore called a micro-resonator. To make a polariton, we need to add something to the light. In between the mirrors, we place a quantum well, which is only a few tens of atoms thick. It is called a well because it traps electrons in its plane so that they cannot escape to the surrounding regions. If a light wave with the right frequency passes through a quantum well, it can give up its energy to release an electron from the atom it is bound to, creating a vacancy. Relative to the surroundings, this vacancy is positively charged and is called a hole. Since the electron and hole have opposite charges, they attract and for a while orbit around each other. This behavior forms a new particle, which we call an exciton. Eventually, the exciton recombines when the electron falls back into the hole. The energy is released as a light wave with the same frequency as the one which originally created the exciton. The quantum well is then placed in the plane that intersects the peak of the light wave. So, when the micro-resonator is calibrated so the resonant light wave and the exciton have the same energy, a single exciton can be converted into a light wave which then converts into an exciton, and so on. The resonant optical cavity can trap the light wave emitted by the exciton so that it returns and creates another exciton, which also decays. A repeating cycle between light wave and exciton is made possible. Since the exciton and light are constantly interchanging, they behave overall like a new particle called a polariton, which has some of the properties of each. One of the most remarkable features of nature is 
that a quantum can pursue two different routes through two different slits come together and manifest itself as a single quantum. But nothing prevents one from saying that the quantum, it might be a photon, to speak of quantum of radiation, or it might be an electron, to speak of a particle, The quantum can go both routes, or it can go a single route. And it's possible to choose which, after the particle has already made its travel, you choose after the particle has decided whether it's going both routes or one route. And after it's got through, you yourself decide which it shall have done. You seem to intervere, intervene to change the past. But quantum theory says it can be done. And I had the pleasure to spell out some of the features of such an experimental arrangement. My University of Maryland colleague, Carol Alley, made changes in the experiment, but without changing the principle and carried it out. And it checked so that we now know it is indeed true that one can decide at the quantum level whether an object can, shall go two routes to get to its final point or just one route. You can make the decision after it's already made the trip. It sounds like a contradiction, but it works. <laughs>